I'm here to introduce one of my mentors, uh, teachers, uh, lead organizer and a leader in this community, in this uh, greater Boston community. Uh, we are, at, uh, we have the opportunity and honor to have with us Ms. Sherry Andes, who is the lead organizer of the Greater Boston Interface Organization, a broad-based organization whose mission is to develop uh, local leadership and organize power. I'm sure you will hear that word uh, throughout uh, her presentation. Uh, Sherry is the lead organizer of the GPIO and she's been doing that role for the past 17 years. So she's really somebody who is, who, who is familiar with what we're trying to do in our community and have done much greater role in the Boston community. Sherry has been, uh, as I said, professional organizer for 17 years and the lead organizer uh, for the GPIO for the past 10 years. In addition to Boston, she has organized in Worcester, Brockton, Metropolitan Chicago. Uh, Sherry has a uh, master's bachelor degree from uh, Pagnell University and master's in pastoral ministry from Boston College. She lives in Framingham with her husband and three sons. I am uh, honored to introduce and uh, call to the podium my mentor, Ms. Sherry Andes. Thank you, Ahmed. Do you think I need the mic? No. 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 Good. <laughs> if I need it, do I need it for this? You need it for this. I know. All right. I'll see how. Okay, so it is my honor and uh, privilege to be with you today, and thank you, Ahmed, for the kind um, introduction. I, um, I have been organizing for a long time. Um, it gets longer every time I get introduced. Um, my children get older every time I get introduced. They are uh, 21, 16, and 9. So any stage of child development you want to know about, I've either been there and done that or I'm in it right now. Uh, but that's not the topic of today. Um, and uh, I've been married for uh, going on 26 years. Got married, thank you. Got married at the tender age of 20 and somehow have made it work. Um, and I want to share a little bit about what I've learned about the work of organizing over these uh, 19 years of my professional career. Um, we're really going to have a dialogue today. I hope that I'm going to learn from you and you're going to learn from me some. I don't know a lot about the Somali community. I'm learning from my brother Ahmed and uh, from my sister Deepo Jabril, who I'll share a story about later. Um, I did a little bit of research on the web and I came across this beautiful proverb which I don't know if, if it's a prominent proverb in your culture. Um, if people come together, they can even mend a crack in the sky. Have you heard that before? Yes. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I thought it was quite beautiful. And it, um, it summarizes quite nicely in a, um, in a, in a poetic form a concept of power, uh, which we're going to talk some about today. Um, um, I want to start, if you would, by suggesting that you all introduce yourselves to me. And here's the way I'd like you to do that. If you could say your name, uh, where you're from, and then a word, just one word. I'll give you a second to think about it. One word about what it's like to be an American Somali. One word about what it's like to be an American Somali. Okay, so I'll give you a second to think about that. So, what, I, I think I know the answer to this based on how you answered the rounds in the first place, but which ways, which ways more, the positives or the negatives? The positives. 
All right, I'm, 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 I'm really happy to hear that. How do you deal with the negatives now in your lives? You work hard. You ignore them. You strive. You educate. I'm sorry, sir? Assertiveness. You stay committed and get more committed to your religion. Self-awareness. I think you've got, you've got a, a workshop on kind of self-development that you're going to have during this time, right? Um, why are you chuckling at that? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so you've got some tools already to deal with some of these positives. I mean, I beg your pardon, some of these negatives. You have some tools. What I want to do today is suggest that there's another tool. Um, and it's not the only tool uh, in your toolkit. It's not even necessarily the best tool. Uh, but it's a tool, and it's a tool that I know and know well, and it's called organizing. It's called organizing, community organizing, if you will. Organizing, nonviolent organizing of people for power to act. For change. And that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about today. The, 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 um, the practice of nonviolent organizing of people. There's, there's two forms of organizing. There's organizing of people and there's organizing of money. Both are forms of power. And I understand you're going to talk some about organizing of money at the end of this conference, which is a form of power. You need that as a community to act. Don't, don't fool yourselves. Um, and don't, don't kid yourselves that you don't have any of that either. The little bit that you have adds up. And the relationships that you have can leverage. But today we're going to talk about predominantly about the organizing of people for power to act for change. What kind of experience do you have now with this tool in your lives? Does anybody have any experience with community organizing now? Can you describe it? So this is a vision you have of organizing an intergenerational gathering of young and old Somali and non-Somali? It's a beautiful vision. It's a beautiful vision. <laughs> Anybody else who has experience with community organizing? Sadia? So I can, what? Uh-huh. Okay, I'm accepting questions from the online audience. Who will, who will speak for the online audience? And Mohammed will speak for the online audience. Okay, and, and, uh, and the sister. Okay. Okay, I, you are acknowledged, online audience. <laughs> this is my first time interacting with an online audience. Anybody else who has experience? Okay, so uh, Ahmed? Yeah, I'm asking, have you got experience with community organizing? You've got a lot. So share a little bit of your experience with community organizing. Here, use the mic. Uh, I guess in this uh, context, what, uh, what I felt was, as a Somalis, we need relationships before we act together. Uh, so if we have um, built that strong relationships, when we act together and challenge, we can stand for one another. But what happens in our community, we, 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 we start with the action without uh, strong relationships. So those actions are not repeatable or are not sustainable. So this is what I find out from the community organizing. 
And that actually is my first point. So I want to lift up three universals of organizing for power. Um, three universals that we look to when we begin to teach a community about organizing. And the first is the importance of relationships. Both internal and external. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So there's first the relationships in and among the Somali community, as Ahmed said. And, uh, and your name again, ma'am? Oh, Shadia. Shadia. As Shadia pointed out, the need to look within the Somali community intergenerationally and uh, cross clan, cross um, geography, and to build those relationships amongst yourself in this country. And I understand you're going to have a workshop on that uh, at the end of your two days together. I think that's uh, a very important topic for you to work on together, is how do you build those relationships amongst yourselves in this country? Because if you are divided amongst yourselves, uh, you will not have the power, you will not have the capacity to address the kind of structural issues, bad schools, drugs in your neighborhood, lack of jobs, those kinds of things that you face and your neighbors face and your colleagues face, other immigrants in this community face, other indigenous people in this community face. You can't do those unless you are together as a, as a, as a community. So there are the internal relationships you need to build but then, not just after that, but while you're doing that, you need to build external relationships too. And building the external relationships will help you with the internal relationships. Okay? Building the external relationships will help you with the internal relationships. And I want to tell you a story about external relationships. How many of you um, from Boston know Bilal Kaleem, the executive director of this uh, Muslim American Society that runs this um, ISBCC? Any of you know Bilal? OK, some of you do. So um, this is a story about external relationships in this community. Um, I met Bilal. I want to say it's going back about four, it may even be five years ago. Um, and Bilal came into my office um, with another gentleman. Um, he called me and said, um, I work for the Muslim American Society. This is before this institution was built, this beautiful building. This was back when um, the offices were in Somerville uh, in a small little suite. And he said, um, you know, I work for the Muslim American Society, and we are just trying to get to know other leaders in the interfaith community in greater Boston so that we can build relationships with them um, so that we can act together. Um, and remember what we talked about here, acting, right, organizing people for power to act. Um, and that's what Bilal was doing. He was beginning to organize. Uh, I don't think he knew that's what he was doing, but that's what he was doing. Uh, he was building external relationships for action. So Bilal came and sat with me, and he was doing the same patiently with about 50 other interfaith leaders all across greater Boston. And, um, as a result of that meeting, I invited Bilal to consider MASS, the Muslim American Society, joining the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. We're an organization of about 50 other congregations, church, synagogue, mosque. So um, the local Roxbury Community Church belongs, local Temple Israel belongs, local um, you know, Roman Catholic Church belongs, and I invited him to consider mass belonging. Bilal took, took us up on that invitation, and through his relationship 
with those 50 institutions that he diligently built and a team of mass leaders, including Muhammad, uh, diligently built over time, um, they began to be part of the fabric of Greater Boston when at one point they were very, very isolated and alone. To the effect where um, they were able to invite the governor of the state to come to this uh, institution once it was built. Um, the governor came, 1,200 Muslims were here, and that's a story in and of itself. Beautiful, beautiful action, event. 1,200 Muslims from all around the world, all greater Boston Muslims from all around the world. The, the most beautiful thing that happened at that event was when Bilal called the roll and he said, um, will everybody from Palestine, Muslim from Palestine, um, say uh, Allah Akbar? And, and they said Allah Akbar. And then he said, will everybody from um, Egypt say Allah Akbar? And they said Allah Akbar. And then he said, will everybody from Somali say Allah Akbar? And they said Allah Akbar. And pretty soon, everybody was saying Allah Akbar to every country. Everybody was from everywhere. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was a, a moment of unity and solidarity that I had never felt before. Um, but in any case, the governor was here. He recognized the community. He affirmed the community's role in public life. Um, and the next day, in the papers, the treasurer of Massachusetts, a man named Timothy Cahill, came out with a statement. And he accused the governor of consorting with terrorists. Within 24 hours, 25 key leaders from across Greater Boston, uh, pastors, rabbis, the head of the Jewish Federation, who had historically had a pretty rocky relationship with this institution and had kept her distance, gathered at Roxbury Presbyterian Church under the auspices of the president of the Greater Boston uh, um, Interfaith Organization and met with Timothy Cahill and called him to task and called him out for what he had done. And within another 12 hours, no, within another eight hours, they were here at the ISBCC on the steps after afternoon prayer, three, four hundred strong, standing with this institution to demonstrate their solidarity with this institution. That was a result of these external relationships that first Bilal and then the rest of the team at this mosque had built. And that allowed them to act and allowed them to call out the treasurer of the state of Massachusetts politically on what he had done and what he had said. So relationships allow us to act. They allow us to have power. Good afternoon, Imam. Welcome. Here. I'm thinking about if this is a picture of the Somali community, um, it's not exactly a good picture of the Somali community, right? Because the Somali community is really multiple communities, as I understand it. Is that fair? Um, and so building internal relationships with the Somali community is this getting these relationships strong, um, intergenerational, cross-clan, cross-geography, getting to know each other in this country, learning who each other are, what you care about here, what your challenges are here, what your dreams are for the future. Because my understanding, and, and, um, and this is where I say we need to learn from each other. I don't mean to be presumptuous. Um, I don't mean to preach. Um, so you can take me to task. You can tell me I'm unrealistic. You can tell me I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Excuse me. Um, but, um, but if your relationships stay all in the past, if they stay solely rooted in the past, 
in your history, in what's happened, uh, both historically and in your immediate families, in your stories. Those stories are important. Um, those stories are fundamental. They're foundational. Uh, and they need to be told. They need to be heard. They need to be understood. But, but if that's all there is, if there's no talk about, what about my kids now, today? What about what's happening in my neighborhood? What is about what's happening at the workplace? What about what's happening in this, in this country that we can address together? Then the future is difficult to see. The future is difficult to act on. And that's what I'm talking about with internal relationships that need to be worked on, that need to be, um, and there are organizations that can help you with this. GBIO, for example, in Boston. We have a sister organization in Washington, D.C. called the uh, Washington Interfaith Network, WIN. I have a good colleague there named Martin Trimble who uh, would be happy to work with the Somali community in, in Washington, D.C. And we have a, a youth organizing arm in Washington, D.C. We have an organization in Portland, Oregon. Um, so there are organizations that would work with you to help you think through how do we build relationships inside our community, given our history, given what we've been through. That's a part of what you need to wrestle with. That's internal. What I'm also saying is you also need allies externally. You can't win as Somalis in America. You can't do it all by yourself. You, you're not going to fix the schools by yourself. You're not going to beat drugs and gangs and, 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 and get affordable housing and, and fix up um, the problem of youth jobs, the fact that um, you know, kids don't have anything to do in the summer. You're not going to solve those problems by yourself. You need allies. You need to talk to um, the Protestant church down the street. You need to talk to the synagogue in the suburbs. You need to build those allies. You need to build allies even beyond the interfaith community. Um, and there are organizations that can help you do that too. Um, that's organizing, okay? So, but you got to get your house in order. Um, it's not step one, step two. You can do both at the same time. And your allies can help you build strength internally as well. Um, so I'm not saying you got to spend 10 years building internally before you can reach out to your allies. I'm not suggesting that, because this is very hard work, and you can't do this all by yourself. You, you need some allies. You need some support. You need models. You can learn some from um, what's happened in the Haitian community, which is also factionalized in a different way. Um, but you know they've got eight, nine churches that belong to the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. Their pastors are trying to put away they, they, they have a problem, which is they worry about stealing one another's people. They, the pastors don't want to sit in the same room because they worry that um, Pastor Noel is recruiting Pastor Solonet's flock, right? And so why would I want to sit with Pastor Solonet when he's out there evangelical, evangelizing Pastor Noel's people? Well, because certified nursing assistants in Greater Boston are 85% Haitian women. And guess what? They don't make a living wage in this state. And if those two pastors don't work together, they can't stand up to the nursing home industry and demand a higher wage for their workers. Do you see how that works? So. Um, so you can learn from your colleagues. You can learn some from what's happening in the Cape Verdean community. You can learn from other immigrant groups. You're not alone.
First of all, I want to thank everybody who's here today. I know that a lot of people come from Ohio, Vermont. Can you hear me now? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, Vermont, Maine, Ohio, Toronto, Philly, Virginia, I think. I just want to share something with you guys. You said, as a Somali community, we cannot work together. Like, we needed other people's help, correct? And I just want to share with you um, Henry Ford quotation that he said it. Um, coming together it's beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is success. I think if we all come together, we could learn something from each other, not only among Somali community, you know, others like Americans, you know, other, other communities, other um, people who came to America like us. So there's a struggle no matter where you came from, and I think we could all do together like other communities. So thank you. Well, that's a beautiful way to conclude um, this portion, and we're going to take a break now for prayer. All right, and we'll come back and conclude the workshop after prayer. Ten minutes. A copy of my great-grandfather, who was also a coal miner, what he called his Book of Days. And he, uh, in his Book of Days, he kept a um, copy of the births and deaths of all of his children, the births of his children, the deaths of his parents, and unfortunately one of his children who was died in World War II, um, the beginning and end of the war, and the beginning and end of all the coal mine strikes. And that was when I got a copy of that book of days, that was very moving for me to see um, the importance uh, that the union played in his life. I hadn't been aware of that prior to seeing that book of days. Um, but the importance that that institution played in um, bettering his life and the life of his family. I also have a copy of my great, great grandmother Bridget, the, the immigrant's uh, obituary. And Bridget was illiterate, as was her husband. I have a copy of his um, signing of the deed of his home, which he owned his own home, by the way. Um, great, great grandfather, uh, immigrated from Ireland, illiterate, coal miner, owned his own home. Um, and he, uh, he signed with an X. Um, and I have, I have a copy of Bridget's obituary, and her obituary says that she died uh, at the age of 83, um, which is remarkable in and of itself. And Bridget was a, this is what her obituary says, she was a leader of a holy name church and a prominent member of the East Side neighborhood. And I was so struck by that, that this Gaelic-speaking immigrant woman would be named as a prominent member of her neighborhood and a leader of her church. And it just struck me again the importance of institutions in the lives, particularly of immigrant families. Um, there was a Frenchman who came to this country in 1840s. His name was Alex de Tocqueville. Have any of you heard of him? You studied him in school? Um, and he, he came to study America because uh, he was a Frenchman, and he was interested in how it was that America had a revolution and we got a democracy. France kept having revolutions, and what did they keep getting? Bonaparte, right? I mean, they, <laughs> they kept getting these, um, these um, dictators. So he was interested in what made America unique. And as he studied this country, he, he came up with this phrase, mediating institutions. It was the... Um, It was the mediating institutions.
It was the churches. It was the farmers' associations. It was the neighborhood associations. It was the mutual aid societies. It was all of the small to medium-sized um, coming together of Americans in civil society that made the fabric of democracy so rich and strong here, that gave people the ability to, um, to form and sustain and uh, practice the art of democratic life. And what's happening in 2011, not just for Somalis, but for everybody in America, is that these institutions, these mediating institutions in our society, are under siege. Have you heard of this guy, Robert Putnam, out of Harvard, who wrote a, a book called Bowling Alone? It's about 10 years old now, um, maybe a little older. And the, the metaphor is that more and more Americans than ever are bowling. But bowling club membership is at an all-time low. Bowling league membership is at an all-time low. So that Americans are more and more and more individuals. This is, you know, institutions versus individuals. And this is some of the cultural pressure that you all find yourselves fighting against the individualism of American society that your youth find themselves up against um, as you try to raise young people in American society is the individualism that pervades the society now versus this notion of the strength and the importance of our mediating institutions, of the mosque, of the synagogue, of the church, of the school, of the club, of the neighborhood association, of the, you know, uh, of the primary um, a family and extended family, quite frankly, which are forms of mediating institutions. Um, so in order to build, we believe that an organized, in order to organize people for power, to act for change, you've got to take the role of the institution seriously. You've got to be about thinking about what are the institutions that your people can belong to, what are the institutions that you can build, uh, where can you invest, whether that's new institutions, or whether that's existing institutions, where can you invest? Where can you build mediating structures that will allow for pockets of power for people to um, develop and grow and have some capacity to engage in public life? Is that, am I making sense? Does this, this resonate at all? What institutions do you all belong to now? A mosque? Any others? Professional organizations. Okay. Sir? S school, college? Alumni association? Any others? Any Somali associations? Are there any Somali associations? There are? Are they, are they strong? Are they? They're all separated? Yeah. Can you speak up? Successful.
You all right? Oh, so you can pass that one around. Ah, uh, no, not from Portland. I'd already know. I'd, I'd already know. Yeah. There's president, um, I don't know his name, but he's from Pakistan. Yeah, they, they're aware of it, and it's really well known on campus too. And it's like, like she said, they have different organizations for Christians, Jews, all those people too, and they have a better understanding among themselves and as well as others. So... Basically, what I wanted to say was uh, it's not unique in one university. It's all over the universities. They have student organizations. It's programs encouraged and supported by the university student relations. So they are part and parcel of being a student in a university. So depending on what like specific connection you have, you can create an organization it's going to be recognized. You're going to have like a budget, uh, an office, and you advance the students you represent, their interests, and uh, anything they need support with. Like, so it's not a unique type deal. It's commonplace across almost all the yeah, campuses. I was just going to add that they have it at Bunker Hill as well. They have that at Bunker Hill. Are you guys, are we talking about the Somali Student Association? No, oh, Muslim, okay. Let me see. Um, an online comment. I have a comment, if I may. I think that the Somali communities and organizations need to collaborate and partner up with their local communities and institutes so that the community as a whole, where we live, understand who lives in the community and how many providers we have in the community on helping their community. these institutions. How are you going to own these institutions? Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, how are you going to make these strong? How are you going to um, equip them over the long run to have the kind of strength and capacity that they need to um, to, to provide the core staff to meet the needs of the community, to, um, to initiate the kind of programming that you want to be able to initiate, to, um, you know, to do the youth outreach work that you want to do, to do the organizing that you want to do, to provide the, um, the hotlines for domestic abuse that you want to do, 
to um, educate the way you want to educate, all of those things, you need to agitate yourselves around ownership because this is a form of power. So to be a strong institution, so you have to value institution. And that um, is countercultural for Americans in this individual society. Um, as well as countercultural in terms of how your institutions are put together. Okay? Um, all right, third item, and then we're going to wrap up um, leadership. Uh, who wants to give me a definition of a leader? A leader is uh, someone who can jar the course and have a higher vision for the rest to work toward. Mm -hmm. Like, create a vision for the rest. Create a vision. Somebody else. Um, someone who can advocate on behalf of a group of people. Someone who can um, lead a group of people and like have them do something like with like great judgments and guide them in the right direction. They have to have patience. Yeah, someone who can empower people. Empower. Empower. Someone who listens. A leader is the one who's chosen by um, people and in a way has given trusteeship over their, like in a democracy, They're, they no longer have the individual choice is given over to the leader. Okay. So it's almost like a trustee. May I add to mine? Someone who has followers. Oh, you cheat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the end of this question. All right, the basic that's definition of a leader. The definition. Now, you all listed some very good attributes. Um, some, okay. Yeah? Um, oh, sorry. A leader is someone who has, you know, bring all kind of community together and work things together, and at the end of the day, make a big accomplishment. Like, a, like our President Obama, you know, you could bring people together and make things perfect, so. <laughs> there you go. Would that it were so, <laughs> that things were perfect, right? Would that it were so. Um, but, but bring people together is, is a good, um, is a good, um, way of thinking about it, a leader has followers. And I don't mean followers in any kind of pejorative way, meaning, you know, sheep. I mean people who will show up like Obama's folks showed up at the polls consistently, and this will be his test the next election, consistently and persistently over and over and over again. That is the definition of a leader. Guess what? You don't need to be tall, handsome, and well-spoken. You don't. Don't need to speak English. 
don't need to have an advanced degree, don't need to be uh, in the limelight. The, uh, when I first started organizing in Brockton, I met a woman named Maria Ocasio. And uh, she was um, Puerto Rican. She didn't speak very good English. The very first, um, we call it an action, the very first community gathering that um, I helped to organize, about 500 people, um, the largest single person who did turnout for that action was Maria Ocasio. She turned out 40 people. Um, you know, everybody else was turning out fives and tens, and Maria turned out 40 people. And so she got my, my radar, my attention, you know. Uh, I said, who brought those 40 people? She actually turned out um, about 20 individuals and about 20 people from the Toyota Club. Um, so I wanted to know, how did Maria turn out? The, the Toyota Club was interesting, and then how'd she turn out those other 20 people? So I went and I sat at Maria's kitchen, and she and I, in her broken English, kind of had a conversation. And I said to her, Maria, how did you turn out those 20 people? And she explained to me that she's a Mary Kay representative. And so she has occasion to sit in people's kitchens and sell them Mary Kay products. And at the time she sells the Mary Kay products, she gets to know them. She chats with them about their family, about their children, about their neighborhood. And so when it comes time for the community event, she can say to them, you told me you care about the gangs. Well, we're having a meeting to deal with the gangs. Why don't you come? That is a leader. I'll tell you another story closer to home. Through a series of relational meetings that my colleague Yusuf Valley was doing with the Muslim community here, he met a Somali woman named Diko Jabril. Some of you know Diko? You know Diko? Um, and um, we invited Diko to a leadership training that GBIO held, a three-day leadership training, which Diko came to. And in the process of doing the leadership training, she learned about a program that we run called Moving from Debt to Assets. It's a, 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 a financial empowerment program where we do um, 16 hours of financial literacy. We do three one-to-one -one individual counseling sessions with a financial counselor. We do um, an ongoing peer support group. And graduates get a $500 check, which they can use to pay off debt or begin to save. And there was a whole organizing campaign that went into getting that, which I could describe to you at some point. Um, Diko learned about this program, and she got very excited about this program, and she wanted to bring it to the Somali community. So after the leadership training, she came to my office, and she spoke with Joel Schwartz, who's our program director, and she said, how can I bring this to the Somali community? And Joel, um, being a good community organizer, in addition to a program director, said, well, you need to put together a leadership team of five other people pull together some followers, and then we'll talk. He wasn't going to just give it to her. You don't, because when you give something to people, what do you take from them? Their dignity, their freedom, their self-initiative, some of those good things that you all put on the front of the sheet of paper when I asked you what it means to be Somali, your self-reliance, right? You don't just give people things. People earn things. They're your dignity, your self-respect, your self-reliance. So Joel said, put together some people. So Diko went and put together a leadership team. Then Joel said, find me a teacher. Diko found us two. Then the task for the five was put together 30 people, Somali women, who want to take this class. They signed up 40. We said, OK. We'll, we'll, we'll run the class. Um, that's leadership, OK? That's leadership. We didn't, we didn't go out and recruit the Somali women. Diko and her team went out and recruited the Somali women. Um, yeah? Was she? That's great. <laughs> her mother was part of that team. 
That's wonderful. Um, so, you know, um, after that, Deco was part of a team, and those women were part of a team that came to a large action with about 400 people at Old South Church, where Timothy Cahill came, the same Timothy Cahill who, um, you know, came out against this community for, um, uh, for the governor coming here, the same Timothy Cahill we negotiated with, no permanent enemies, no permanent allies in public life. We went to him and asked him to divest $100 million of the state's money from Bank of America, because Bank of America was hurting this community and other communities by charging 29% interest rates and refusing to negotiate on foreclosed properties for people who um, had mortgages with them. And the Somali community turned out in a major way for an action where we were asking Timothy Cahill to divest those dollars in Bank of America. And Deco Jabril was the organizer who helped turn those people out. That's organized people. That's power. That's leverage. That's organizing. OK? So that's what we mean by leadership. Questions? It's not something you're born with, necessarily. There are a few people who seem to know this skill from birth. Um, but it's something you can learn. It's something you can teach. How do you identify, uh, I mean, from the youth, um, young leadership, people who you think would be interested in this, or people who you think are capable, at least more capable than others? The question is, how do you identify youth who may be capable of this kind of work? Well, we have a radical tool. Um, radical may be a difficult word in this community. Um, <laughs> think of another word. Fundamental tool um, that we use um, in our organizing. Um, and it's called a relational meeting. Sometimes it's shorthanded as a one-to-one. -one. Um, and it's a tool that we use for um, identifying, recruiting, training, and developing potential leaders. And it's basically the process of one leader sitting down individually, face to face, with another person and getting to know that person um, and their interests. Their story, so history is important. Their passion, if they have any. Their, their appetite, their values, their vision. And then agitating them, putting it all together, calling them out on that. I hear where you come from. I hear that. I hear what you say you're about. Now, the key question is, what are you going to do about it? Not everybody has the kind of passion it takes to act in public life. Not everybody has the kind of values it takes to act in public life. Not everybody has the willingness to act in public life. But guess what? A lot more people do than we give them credit for. A lot more people do. And we just failed to challenge them. That's our failure, particularly with our young people. That's our failure. So it takes a leader sitting down one to one listening to the stories, where do you come from, what have you been through, what are you up against, then listening to the values, what do you care about, what do you, what do you value, what are you, what are you uh, passionate about, what do you want to see change, what do you care about, 
and then challenging them. And so, what are you prepared, willing, going to do? And then you got to be willing to walk alongside them and help do it with them. That's, that's organizing. And that's what we got to do with our young people. We got to do a lot more of it with our young people. Is that helpful? Okay. Other questions on leadership? Ma'am. How, what's the best way to recruit people, followers? What's the best way to do it? Same way, relational meetings. So people come to events and, um, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to use this event as an example, okay? People don't come because of an email blast. People don't come because of a flyer in the mail or a flyer on their door. People come because somebody they know, trust, and respect, somebody who knows them, trusts them and respects them, invites them and says, I think this is important to you. Why? Because I know you. I know you. I've sat down with you. We've met. I've heard your story. I've heard your passion. I've heard what you care about. And therefore, I think this would be good for you. Part of what a relational meeting does is it helps you know what a person cares about and what they value. The other thing a relational meeting does is it builds a bond. Right? If, if I get to know Muhammad, and I get to know what he cares about and what he's passionate about. But then the flip side is, if Muhammad gets to know me, he gets to know what I care about, what I'm passionate about. And in the process, we build a little respect, a little trust, a little reciprocity. Then we have a little bond. We, we have a little caring. So when I ask Muhammad to come to something, he's more likely to come than if I just email blast him in the mail. So that's how you build a following. It's, it's built over time. It's kind of painstaking work. There's no shortcut. Um, but any one of you is capable of going from having one follower to five followers to 25 followers in a year's time. And let me tell you something. 25 followers is a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. When I come into a community and I start organizing, anybody who can put together what I call a house meeting, which is five or six people in a room, is a leader as far as I'm concerned. Five to six people in their living room for a conversation is a leader. And there just aren't that many people who can do it. So any of you can do that. OK. Do you have another question? Often you see, like, let's say you recruit a group of people who are interested, who, ha who have the same values as you, and they are willing to help whatever leadership you're doing. But there's a problem on how to keep them focused and to keep having their attention because oftentimes you see people even though they're interested even though they are passionate about it that they wander off and they're not over time they are not as constantly showing up in various meetings and how how do you do that how do you keep their attention especially youth well let me, lead, let me take that and lead it into my next point. Um, and which is my last point, because I see the soda's arrived. Is there, is there lunch with that? Yeah, yeah. OK, so. <laughs> um, particularly with youth, but with adults too, um, you can't just stick with relationships, okay? You can't just 
spend all your time building institutions. You can't just leadership people to death. Um, most conferences that you go to have got some component of leadership development. And you can leadership develop people to death. Okay, So you can't just leadership develop people all your life. Uh, at some point, and some point pretty early on, inside of your work, you got to act. You got to do something. My friend over here was sharing a story with me. Uh, may I? Uh, your environmental story from Vermont? Was sharing a story with me about um, his, his, his school in Vermont, and if I get the details wrong, you'll correct me, um, where they spent, his, his group in Vermont spent a year trying to show a movie. That will kill a group. All right? And then they dissolved because they all graduated. But if you spend a year trying to show a movie, you will kill your group. You got to show the movie. You got to act. You got to do something. So here's a story about action for young people. One of the I, I brought you two booklets, by the way. They're outside. One is on rebuilding institutions. And one is on action creates public life. Um, so they're both out there. You can just take them. Um, so here's a story. There's an organization that belongs to GBIO, um, and it's called Wymore. Um, it's affiliated with the Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation. And it's an organization of young people, high school students, as a matter of fact. Um, and they're all inner city uh, kids, mostly Dorchester, mostly African American, some Haitian, some Cape Verdean. And uh, a couple of years ago, they got interested in the, in the problem of youth jobs. Now, why did they get interested in youth jobs? They all have jobs because Wymore is a, is a youth job program. So they, get, they actually get a little stipend to do youth organizing. But they got interested in the problem of youth jobs because their brothers and sisters didn't have youth jobs, um, because their friends didn't have youth jobs, and because um, they'd seen kids die. They'd been seeing kids die, and they um, drew a line between young people dying and the lack of jobs in the, in the, in the, in the city. And about two years ago, I think it was two years ago, the state, during, as a result of the recession, the state was threatened with having its summer job program cut in half. The city is actually quite progressive. The mayor is actually quite progressive in providing about 10,000 jobs for young people in this city. But because of state cuts, that was going to be threatened. Um, and so Wymore went into action and decided that they wanted to do something. They had a meeting with Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz and Representative Walsh and asked them if they would prioritize jobs for youth. These are high school kids, all right? So they didn't sit around for a year and study youth jobs. They didn't um, write papers on youth jobs. They didn't make a video of kids dying on the streets. They went into action. Do you understand what I'm saying? They took some action. They went and met with their senator and their rep, and they, they told their stories. And they asked for help. And they demanded help. And Senator Shona Chan Diaz and Rep Representative Walsh said to them, we will prioritize this, but let us tell you something. We don't have the power to make this happen. You need to go get the suburban legislators, you know, inner city senator and representative, 
telling high school kids, you all need to go get the suburban legislators, you know, just think about this, um, to, to support youth jobs. Something off about that to you? This is, you know. <laughs> but that's what they said. And you know what these kids said? What do you think they said? All right. They said, all right. And they came to GBIO, because uh, they're members of GBIO, and they said, is there a way you can help us get relationships with the suburban legislators? And we said, we can help you get those relationships. And we sent the, suburban, the, the city kids off to meet with suburban kids, young people, high school kids, at Temple Israel in Newton, Brookline, um, at Temple Isaiah in Lexington, and um, at Workman Circle, which is a secular humanist organization in Brookline, all which have organized youth chapters. And they met with young people in those um, three institutions, and those young people said, we will help you. And those young people went and met with their senators and reps. And at first, their senators and reps said, what, you want us to support some urban issue and make it a priority? But those kids were very, very, very persistent. And at the end of the day, Senator Cream, who initially said no, she would not, she's um, Newton, initially said no, she would not make this a priority. Senator Cream was on the Senate floor saying to her colleagues that the youth from Wymore and from the suburban institutions had convinced her that this was a priority for the Commonwealth. Um, and the youth jobs money uh, two years ago was saved, last year was saved, this year, Senator Hart from the inner city, they got the tape from the, from the uh, footage from the Senate hearing this year. Senator Hart quoted the young people in the, in the final vote saying that um, he had learned from the Wymore youth that young people were using their summer job money um, to supplement their parents' income, not just for sneakers. And Senator Fargo, from Lexington, who had two years in a row voted against the summer jobs money, this year voted for it and said that these were the most impressive young people she is, and most persistent, remember that show up consistently and persistently, persistent young people she had ever met in her life. Um, so after two years, she changed her vote. Um, so you, 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 you gotta move into action. You, 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 you can't sit around in committees. People get tired. Um, they want to do something. They need to do something. Action is the lifeblood of organization. Okay? Questions? Yep? How do you deal with failure in terms of organizing? How do you deal with failure in terms of organizing? It's a very good question. Um, there are a couple things. First of all, you should always start small um, so that you increase your chances of victory. Um, secondly, um, you know, it's a good question because I don't have a lot of experience with failure. <laughs> I like to win. Um, let me think about it for a minute. Um, This is uh, based on my um, school-based health center organization, and basically we, we do um, different projects regarding teen awarenesses, and every project we take the data we have, we take a survey, giving them to the students, and then we analyze those at the end of the week, and then we see we kind of ask questions among ourselves, say what we did so far, what was successful and what was unsuccessful, and what were 
what were the outcome of each activities that we did. And then after that, we find mostly every time there's something that didn't work out quite as well as we would like to. And we learn from that. And next project, we try to do better in a in different way. So that's a way to learn your failure. Well, that is the answer. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about my biggest organizing failure. Um, GBIO, and this is an important story because um, we learned so much from it. GBIO, some of, some of our um, accomplishments are we, we um, organized, we collected 100,000 signatures collectively, our 55 institutions around the greater Boston collected 100,000 signatures to convince the state legislature to um, increase affordable housing by $100 million. Um, we collected 55,000 signatures on a statewide ballot petition, joined a, city, a statewide coalition that helped reform health care in this state. Um, half a million people now have health insurance in this state as a result of our leadership and the coalition that we were members of. Um, we've done a number of other, uh, 700 people have graduated from the debts to assets program that I told you about. Um, so we, we a number of major victories. We had a major defeat a number of years ago. We organized $5 million from our member institutions, churches, synagogues. We didn't have any mosques members at that time of no interest construction financing money to build um, several hundred units of affordable housing that we would call Nehemiah housing. And we were going to build it on the old Boston State Hospital property. Do you remember this, Mohammed? And um, we, uh, we made a major miscalculation. We thought we could get the state to give us that land. And in order for the state to give us that land, we needed several things. We needed the local community support. We needed the mayor's support, we needed the governor's support, and we needed the support of Senator Diane Wilkerson. Um, now, we brought $5 million to the table. We brought no interest construction financing to the table. We brought the governor's support to the table. We brought the mayor's support to the table. But we were not able to secure either the local community support nor Senator Wilkerson's support. And at the end of the day, we lost that project. We lost that project. And it was a, a bad power analysis on our part. It was a lack of relationships. We didn't do our work. We did not get on the ground in Mattapan and build the kind of relationships door to door, person to person, neighbor to neighbor, with the neighbors in Mattapan that we needed to build, nor did we have the kind of relationship, I'm not sure we could have ever gotten it, but nor did we have the kind of relationship with Senator Wilkerson we needed to make that deal happen. And we lost it. And uh, Sister here is absolutely right that the only thing you can do from a loss like that is learn. And you darn well better learn. Because you put a lot at risk when you, when you lose $5 million. Uh, you put a lot at risk. So you better learn something, and you better apply it to your next campaign. Because uh, if you lose too often, um, you know, you can't survive. That was not the story I wanted to end on. <laughs> Is there some other question that we can lift up and uh, be positive? The question that was answered is, what do you do when, um, when you fail? Last question. We got one more question? One more online? How do you deal with bad leadership without antagonizing people? OK. We got any more positive questions out there? <laughs> um, Bad leadership. Uh, well, you know, there is, if you can build a culture 
of if you can build a culture around leaders are people with followers, not the ones who show up and speak up. This problem usually, not always, there are exceptions to this, and there are a lot of historical exceptions to this, but usually in local culture, the problem usually takes care of itself. Because the bad leaders usually in local culture don't have much of a following. They're the, they're the bomb throwers. They're the ones who show up and speak up, but don't have much of a following. Right? So if you can build a culture within your own organization that values real leadership and where um, the folks on the board are on the board, in GBIO, um, you can't be on the board unless you can turn out at least 25 people and you have the backing of your institution as an institutional leader. So that's a requirement for board leadership. Um, so if you can build a culture where leaders uh, are expected to have followers, um, then it's more, if you can build a positive culture around leadership where leaders are valued for what they bring to the table. Um, usually, the quote, bad leaders, the folks without followers, they usually just melt away because they don't belong. They recognize that this is not a culture where their show up, speak up tactics are welcome. And they usually go somewhere else where they can dominate because they're really looking to dominate. That's what they're looking to do. Um, so be positive. That's how I want to end. Be positive um, and try to build a strong culture with strong institutions, strong relationships, strong leaders uh, that move towards action for change. Okay, I really appreciate being with you all today and I wish you a lot of luck. Ahmed has my card if any of you uh, want to reach me for any reason. Thank you very much. Uh it's really an honor, as I said, for all of us. And I will challenge you as, uh, you know, community, as uh, uh, colleagues, peers. Uh, I will challenge you if you can turn on uh, 20 or more uh, youth in your local community. I will negotiate with GBIO and Sherry and the rest of our staff to, to, to come to you and train you. And, 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 and make available to you, to us as a community, these skills. And I really, really uh, believe that what we as a community, as a Somali community, what we missing, we missing these kind of trainings and skills in order to move on. Uh, I, you know, again, want to thank you, Sherry, for her time. And, uh, and I also want to thank one more time, one more person who made this possible, which is uh, Yusuf Ifali, who is uh, one, of, one of her uh, community organizers who is in LA for training. He really, really did a lot of work behind the scenes and he made this uh, moment possible. Thank you very much. We have the lunch.